Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll begin momentarily as people start to trickle in and, and sign on to the webinar. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited about this session, the Marketer's Guide to Accessibility. Uh, just have a couple housekeeping items I want to take care of before we get started. First off, this session is being recorded and we will email everyone the recording after the event. Uh, we have live captions available. Feel free to use those as needed. And lastly, if time permits, um, we'll do live Q&A at the end of the ses session. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the, the chat box, so the, Q the Q and A box that Zoom provides um, and we'll handle those at the end of the session. So I'll introduce myself first and then Marissa will introduce herself. Uh, my name is Mike Mooney. I'm the digital marketing manager at TPGI. I have six years experience in marketing with a focus in digital marketing. And I've been learning about accessibility and creating inclusive experiences for over a year. Uh, with TPGI, and I'm excited to share some of those insights with you today uh, on how it pertains to marketing. Uh, Marissa? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I am a Senior Product Marketing Manager here at TPGI. I've been with TPGI for almost four years. I have an MBA in marketing, and I have about 15 years of marketing experience. And uh, I'm very excited to talk to everybody about how you can improve your marketing overall with accessibility best practices. Awesome. <clears throat> so we'll go over the agenda quickly here today. Uh, we'll start with what is digital accessibility and set the stage uh, for the conversation today. We'll go over user experience, website pages, chatbots, email marketing. We'll discuss multimedia, PDFs, social media, SEO, and then some accessibility testing tools um, that everyone can kind of utilize um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So getting into it, what is digital accessibility? And really what digital accessibility is, is providing inclusive experiences for all. So the World Bank estimates that about a billion people worldwide, that's roughly 15% of the population has some level of disability, whether that's a, a visual hearing, a motor or a cognitive disability. And, and so when we think about digital accessibility and creating digital experiences, we think about providing inclusive experiences all because digital disabilities change the way people consume digital content. So just to kind of get a perspective, blind or low vision users rely on screen readers or screen magnifiers to read the content. Um, and individuals with limited mobility may only be able to use a keyboard to navigate the content. Um, and people with cognitive disorders may only be able to focus on disparate pieces of content rather than the entire page. So when you go to create uh, a website or an application uh, or just a new a blog page for your site, thinking of, of the, the collective whole and making sure that your content is accessible to someone that uses a screen reader or uh, needs to navigate your site with a keyboard is, is very critical to ensuring that they're able to access that content, especially if you're, you know, have an e-commerce website or someone trying to tra transact the banking um, transaction. Uh, so making sure that all these uh, different pe people, difference, different pieces of content is accessible is, is super important. Um, now, the beautiful thing about this is there are guidelines for ensuring digital accessibility. So the web accessibility standards are known as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, also referred to as WCAG. Uh, they come from the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, and they're currently on version 2.1. And the WCAG provides criteria for content 
creators that will help ensure an accessible digital experience. So you don't need to be an ex accessibility expert to conform to many of the WCAG criteria. Um, and, and this really helps community of digital creators, developers, designers, and, and marketers like you and I to work cross-functionally and create accessibility, uh, accessible experiences and content. And that's really what we're gonna talk about next um, is user experience. And so user experience, we can kind of think about the different user flows that may, are made up on the different websites and applications that are on our digital content today. And that may even span to, to multiple sites. And so when you think about user flows, they're primarily objectives that users may need to complete on your website. And so on screen here, I have an image of a collection of pages with highlighted um, areas of these pages where users might flow and navigate to based on their objectives and what they need to accomplish on that site. Um, now, the, there are a lot of lawsuits around digital accessibility, which includes achieving objectives on your website. Now, this is not in all cases, but it's something to be aware of. And so if you do identify accessibility issues within specific user flows, um, for example, if, if someone comes to your site and one of the objectives is to just schedule a conversation to talk to a representative or an expert um, at your company, if, if they are unable to complete that form and that critical function of that user flow, um, then that could trigger a lawsuit. Similarly with uh, an e-commerce platform, uh, adding items to a checkout cart and someone trying to check out, uh, these are critical functions that people need to complete in order to achieve their objective and complete a successful user experience. So when you're able to identify these issues, you can narrow the focus, prioritize the accessibility issues in these user flows, and then I hopefully improve the experience for everyone. And when I, when I say everyone, I do mean that it could be typically what we see is people with, when we create user experiences that are accessible for everyone with disabilities and without disabilities, it ends up being a better user experience for everyone. Um, and we have some examples of that later on, but identifying these critical user flows on your site, um, there's a couple ways to get started. On screen, I have a screenshot of a Google Analytic goal funnel. Uh, hopefully some of you are familiar with this. Um, if you're not familiar with Google Analytics, I definitely recommend diving into them. Um, but when you use your Google Analytic goals and funnels, you're able to, you can actually identify specific issues impacting the steps in the user flows. You know, looking at different conversion rates at each stage of the funnel. Um, if there's an unusually you know, high abandonment rate or a high bounce, that might be a good area to start. And then using some accessibility testing tools like Arc Toolkit and Arc Monitoring, which we'll talk about in a second, you can able, you're able to prioritize and remediate those accessibility issues and, and hopefully try to increase and improve upon those conversion rates. Um, so analyzing user flows with Arc, uh, this is a, ARC is a, is a software that TVGI provides. It stands for the Accessibility Resource Center. And on the screen, there's a screenshot of the ARC platform and it's <clears throat> displaying a user flow dashboard. And using ARC you, and, and kind of like thinking about Google Analytics and the goal funnel we were just talking about, you can actually drill into individual components of those user flows in the ARC platform and identify and, and, and push um, some, some issues to your developers to try to remediate that. The other benefit of ARC is, is leveraging the monitoring and we'll discuss that more in a little bit, um, but you can actually track performance and trending over time. And so when you do make initiatives at your organization to fix some of the accessibility issues that you've uncovered, you can actually release the new code updates and, and see if your fixes are actually uh, trending in the right direction. And then if they're not, then you know you need, there's some more work that needs to be done and you can dive back in. Um, and so I'm gonna let Marissa take over this next section here, website pages. Thanks, Mike. 
So as a digital marketer, you know that your website is your digital presence. And this is where people will purchase uh, products from you. They can contact you. They can find out information about your products and services. It's basically a online um, store. And if you have an inaccessible website, it's basically a store office where someone with a disability is locked out. And Mike and I are here to help you remove these locks to make sure that anyone can access your services and your products and um, talk to you. Uh, Marissa, I think you might be on mute. So one of the things to keep in mind is that if you have images on your site, I'm using it. It's the code. It's not going to interpret an image. It's not a magician. It can't see an image. So if there are images on your site that are necessary to understand the content or are necessary for all of the content to make sense, always add um, alternate text to them. Next. Also, make it easy for users to skim your stuff. And as Mike mentioned earlier, when you make your site accessible to people with disabilities, it also improves the experience for everyone. So for example, you want to make sure that you use proper headers on your site. So always start out with an H1 and then work your way down H2, H3, potentially H4 if you have a decent amount of copy. And make sure you use them appropriately. Don't just style all H1s or H2s so they look different visually because a screen reader is actually able to skim your site um, using the keypad. So this means that you will be able to break up your content, which is also great because who wants to read a giant dense block of content? Um, and it makes it easier for people with all different types of disabilities, the cognitive, um, the mobile, someone using a screen reader, um, and it improves the user experience for everyone. And when in doubt, just break it down, make it simpler. Also choose your colors wisely. So on screen, I have two logos. One is a uh, TPGI, which is a dark blue on a yellow background. And then I also have some delightful Christmas color TPGI uh, logo with a yellow background. So which color combination is more appealing um, to if you can see the screen? So I personally like the former, the yellow background with the blue. And uh, that's great because it actually uses a appropriate color contrast ratio. So as part of the web content accessibility guidelines, Mike mentioned earlier, one of the criteria for accessibility is actually using an appropriate color contrast ratio. And this is critical because people with low vision or um, color blindness may not be able to distinguish if colors do not have um, a high enough contrast ratio. And you may be thinking, I don't even know what that ratio means or how to get that ratio, but you know what, that's okay because TPGI has a free color contrast checker tool that we will put in the chat at the end and you can go to our website and download it to make it super simple. So most websites have forms. Um, and if your website does have a form, there are some considerations for you to uh, implement to ensure that it is accessible. So there are non-technical and then there are technical. The non-technical are fairly easy to implement. You know, keep it short and simple, provide clear instructions and visible labels so people know exactly what they need to input. Um, you need to validate the inputs. So if someone has put in something incorrectly, let them know exactly what is wrong with it and what needs to be changed. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than trying to fill out a form and it keeps giving you an error and you have no idea why. And imagine if you are a screen reader user and you can't even see the screen and it's not telling you why. So always make sure there is uh, a reason for the error. Um, make sure that you notify the user if they've been successful or if there's a failure, as I mentioned before. If your form has to be long, then consider adopting a multi-page or a progressive form. And this is actually helpful for 
anyone using a form. People, regardless of their abilities, get bored and annoyed, annoyed with long forms. So if you can break it down, um, it makes it a lot more likely they're going to actually finish the form. And also remove time limits or provide options. Someone who is using a screen reader or only a keyboard or you know, maybe has um, cognitive disabilities may not be able to fill out a form in the same amount of time as someone without a disability. And it's stressful to have that timer in the background and even worse if it times out and they're ultimately not able to submit. So do yourself a favor and just remove them. I know as marketers, we love that sense of urgency, but in this case, it's not the best use of that. The technical considerations, and these are things that you can pass on to your developer or if you happen to have developer skills, great, you can implement them yourself. Um, so just make sure that the form is operable by keyboard alone. Use the label elements and the four attributes. Um, make sure you have grouping controls like field set and legend. Uh, you need to associate the related controls with ARIA. Uh, make sure that your font size is appropriate. Usually 14 font is the minimum that you want to use on a form. And of course, the color contrast, like we mentioned earlier, and then run it through a rules engine just to make sure there are no accessibility failures. So one product that we'll talk about later is Arc Toolkit, which will help you. It has a, um, it uses the Arc platform rules engine, which is our um, accessibility platform for all of your accessibility needs. So you can use the Arc Toolkit. Next. Also, try not to communicate critical information through hover states and tooltips. Um, unfortunately, if you are not using a mouse, um, like screen reader users or someone who's just using a keyboard because of mobility issues, uh, it is very hard for them to access a uh, tooltip. So if you have to use a hover state or a tooltip that relays information, make sure that they are reachable and operable by a keyboard. So, and this is what you can tell their, your developer, they will appear on focus as well as hover um, and make sure they are screen reader compatible. So there are multiple ways to acquire the information, but the overall recommendation is that just don't use them. If the information is important enough to go on your site, it's really important enough to be in plain view. Breadcrumbs are a great way for people to navigate the site, to understand exactly where they are, where they came from, and they are helpful for everyone, regardless of their ability. You just wanna make sure that users always know where they are on your site and how to get back to the homepage. Meaningful link text. This is one of my favorites actually. Um, so you may not be used to writing meaningful link text. I know that a lot of us are just used to uh, linking click here or download or go to or just linking something that really doesn't have a lot of context. So this is a problem because not only for screen reader users, um, because they're able to skim an entire page and just see all the links or they will hear all the links rather. And if they hear a link that says download or click here, they're not going to know what that means at all. So what you want to do is make sure that you have informative link text, sign up for our webinar, contact us today, review your purchase. So anyone, regardless of their ability, will know exactly what they're going to get when they click on this link. Chatbots. Chatbots have become very popular in the past few years, and they are honestly a great addition to a site. Um, they can be very helpful in routing more complex queries or even answering mundane questions that your customer service team doesn't have time to do. However, um, they are usually an out-of-the-box chatbot solution. Most companies do not have the internal um, resources to actually create a custom chatbot. And just keep in mind that as a third-party software you are responsible for anything that's on uh, your site, regardless if it's third party or something that you created. And some of the issues like uh, contrast and some layout, they may be able to be addressed by um, one of your developers with strong CSS skills, but a lot of the issues that a person with a disability may run into are core problems with the chatbot software itself. And scripting, it can't fix it all um, because the underlying code from the chatbot vendor has um, things that change with each render, making it possible to target. So 
one way you can safeguard this is first, um, get a credible accessibility expert to test any chatbot solution before you implement it, just so you understand the level of risk that you're taking on. And also check to see if your vendor has an accessibility statement or some type of guarantee, and then build it into the contract. It's If it is an inaccessible um, part of your site, it's not going to fully protect you from any risk, but um, it will give you a, a better sense of how much risk you'll be exposed to. Email marketing. We love email. Who doesn't? I mean, it has a return on investment of something like 35 times, which is fantastic. We use it a lot here. Um, but when you're doing it, always keep in mind that you need to use alternative text for your images. It's the same thing with websites. Um, a screen reader user is going to be using email as well. And if they can't see the image and there's no alternative text, they are not going to know what's going on. Um, so just always make sure that you include that, regardless of whether it's uh, you know, a MailChimp or a constant contact, usually um, all email platforms will have that option to add the alt text. Don't be stingy with your tags on email. So again, make sure that you have the H1 for the title and the H1 is not the subject line, it's going to be the title. Use H2s for subheaders. And if you find yourself in need of an H3, you may wanna rethink your email content and send your visitors to a landing page copy instead. And this is also a best practice for marketing in general, just you know, emails that have too much information are overwhelming and you're better off just sending someone to your web page. Um, remember to include the P tags, your body copy, and you can even use the title tag to provide context. Now, if you have a, um, a visual email, so an HTML-based email, then you need to be aware of a minor addition to your code. So back in the day <laughs> when the web was beginning, it was actually used by scientists to share data. So they use data tables. And as more and more people got interested in this crazy new worldwide web, the developers who were developing websites for the internet started using these tables for their own purposes. So they would fill them with images and uh, content. And so that was the old way of building websites. If some of you are, you know, were around <laughs> in the early 90s, uh, early 2000s, then you'll remember this was the way of building websites. Now we don't do that, but a lot of HTML emails still utilize these tables for their content. So because these tables are actually used for data, what you wanna do is add the role equals presentation code to let screen reader users know that these are presentation tables, not data tables. And it will actually change the way the screen reader reads what is in the tables. So it makes sense for that screen reader user. And remember that people read a lot of email on mobile devices. So aim to keep your text above 14 points. Um, if people can't read your message on mobile, they're not going to read it at all. As always, keep your color contrast uh, to accepted guidelines. Avoid center aligned paragraphs, which are much harder to read anyway, and make link text informative and short. So all of these things are applicable across websites as well as emails, really any type of digital content. And I keep hammering home this point. These are all things that are going to help everybody. It's going to improve the user experience for anyone, regardless of their um, ability to consume your content. Multimedia. So multimedia is fairly straightforward. Always include your captions on the video. And this is great, not only because everyone will be able to understand what's going on in the video, but it's also helpful for people without disabilities who are in different situations, such as somebody who wants to watch a Instagram video on a, in a public place, but they don't have any headphones. Or if you're sitting in a doctor's waiting room and you happen to see a video on TV, it's on mute. You don't understand what's going on, but if they have captions, you can. Other considerations. So if you host podcasts or other audio multimedia, make sure you have a transcript on the page. If you are deaf, then a podcast is a non-issue. <laughs> they won't know what the content is at all unless you have a transcript. Um, there are also, transcripts are highly recommended even for videos that have captions 
However, um, if you're hosting videos on a platform like YouTube, the transcript that is part of the YouTube um, is sufficient for most organizations. But best practices, like if you're hosting something on your site, um, would be to provide a link to the transcript. And then video descriptions are a nice touch. A video description is narration that's used to communicate key visual elements to blind or uh, low vision individuals. So for example, if there is a, a poignant scene where nobody's talking, there's just a lot of music, um, the audio description will actually describe what's going on in the scene so everyone knows what's going on. PDFs. Um, PDFs, like every other digital content, need to conform to the same accessibility guidelines as websites. So they need that same logical reading order. Um, they need the headings and subheaders to facilitate faster and easier comprehension and alt text for images. Creating an accessible PDF ranges from very easy to very complicated. So if you have a very simple Word document, Maybe it just has a couple images. Um, just make sure you add the alt text and you can create it to an accessible PDF in the Acrobat tab and then create um, PDF. So before doing that though, just make sure you use the native accessibility checker. So that is part of Word and PowerPoint. Um, Adobe Acrobat Pro also has a native accessibility checker function that's very helpful. However, if you have a longer, more complicated document, so if you have a Word document that has a lot of different components, or if you've created something in Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign, and you need to convert that to a PDF, um, you may want to call an expert because there are a lot of different considerations um, that need to be done on documents like that. And you can use the Adobe Acrobat Pro native checker. It's just, it's a little more complex to do. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Marissa. All uh, right. I think we're going to talk about social media now. Um, so similar to the website and a lot of what Marissa just covered, uh, creating inclusive experiences doesn't stop at social media. Um, we should continue that. It's an extension of your brand. And so um, the first two topics on under this um, umbrella is image alt text and video captions, which Marissa, Marissa touched on earlier. Um, and a lot of the social platforms over the past couple of years have actually been releasing accessibility features um, to allow marketers and, and anyone posting content to um, make it more inclusive and, and provide accessible experiences. So when you go to post an image, uh, make sure that you're describing what that image is through the alt text. Uh, and similarly, when if you're providing or releasing some video co uh, content, uh, make sure that you're providing video captions so that everyone can experience this and, and enjoy your content. Uh, next is hashtags. Um, and it's this is a pretty critical um, thing that not a lot of people think about uh, because we've been you know using hashtags since they became popular and analyzing which ones are gonna you know connect you with the audience you want to um, connect with. Uh, and if people aren't able to, to understand what these hashtags are, then uh, through the use of screen readers, then um, they're not a, they're not really going to be able to connect with your brand the way you want them to, or or find your content. So, uh, using using Camel Case when creating hashtags and capitalizing these words or phrases that you combine into a um, into a hashtag is critical for screen reader users to actually be able to read and understand what, what you're trying to convey or say. Uh, and I have an example of that in, in just a moment. Uh, so for, for the camel case, it's just capitalizing each word. So if camel case was a hashtag, it would be capital C, capital C, camel case um, versus lowercase ca uh, Cs. Uh, and the same goes for emojis. Um, uh, so on, on screen now, I have a fictitious social post and I will read through this as a sighted person would interpret it. And then I will read through it as if a screen reader uh, is, is reading through this content. And so uh, check out this five-star review, schedule your appointment now, hashtag five-star reviews. And so easy enough for, for uh, anyone who's sighted to understand what you're trying to convey here. Um, now, as a, as a screen reader user, a screen reader will read this as so check out this yellow medium star 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 review schedule your appointment now 
and a screen reader will read this hashtag as numerous views. Um, and so this is something that most people don't think about. It wasn't something that I thought about prior to working with TBGI. And I, I, I hope this like sinks in for people to kind of make some changements, changes and adjustments to how you um, create and think about social media and your content. Um, so drafting this post in a different format, check out this five-star review, yellow medium star, schedule your appointment now, hashtag five-star reviews. And so this is just uh, provides a better experience for everyone. It gets the same message across um, and it minimizes the amount of emojis used. And so for social media, those are just a couple of takeaways I hope hope uh, resonate with you and you'll, you'll take into it and adopt in your practice moving forward. But with social media and emojis, uh, less is more. Um, all right, let's dive into SEO. SEO, organic optimization, I hope everyone is familiar with this. Um, the good thing is what we see is there's a lot of overlap between organic optimization and what's good for SEO is good for accessibility. Um, and a, the other good thing is that we've covered a some of these today uh, in, in previous topics. Uh, dues for SEO on your website and digital content. Again, make sure you're describing your, your images and utilizing those alt tags with relevant descriptions. Um, you also have the option of using image captions. You don't have to use both. You can you have some flexibility to do either. Um, video transcripts, uh, you can actually check out tpgi.com and, and some of our video content on there and, and see how we do it. But we have links to video transcripts for anyone that wants to, to utilize a transcript versus going through the entire video. It's, it's great for screen reader users. Uh, link anchor text, um, making sure that your link anchor texts are descriptive, not just saying click here, uh, making sure that they're descriptive and people understand like what they're actually going to click to or experience next. It's, it's good for SEO as well. Um, proper descriptive title tags, making sure that your, your headers and, um, are actually descriptive of what some a user is, is going to consume or, um, or read um, is critical to providing them and people with screen reader users, the, um, they're experiencing uh, what they're they intend to get into next. Uh, proper and sequential use of header tags. Again, making sure you're not starting off with H4, start off with H1, H2, H3, keep it linear um, and, and make sure it's logical. And the last one here is time on page and additional related searches. So on screen, there's a, a screenshot from a, a tweet last year um, to the search advocate of Google, John Mu. And the question is, is it possible that Google will ever factor in the accessibility metric with search results ranking? And John responded, I won't say never, but I'm not aware of any immediate plans. In general though, when sites are hard to use, people stare away from them anyway. So over time, things like recommendations and other signals tend to drop away, resulting in the site being less visible in search too. And, and so I think a good takeaway here is if you know your site's not accessible, um, and, and people are bouncing because they're not able to, to navigate it, whether with, with their keyboard or using a screen reader, um, then it, it's likely to trickle into your SEO as well. Um, and, and you might experience some, some higher bounce rates and, and a de-ranking in the SERPs. So um, it's, it might be a good best practice to make sure that you're creating accessible content. Now, some SEO don'ts. Don't stuff keywords in any of the attributes used for SEO or accessibility, um, like alt tags, title tags, captions, and transcripts. Don't use images as text. It's not generally accepted that images are machine readable. Um, so again, um, if you do have to use, uh, or you do wanna create a word cloud that is not made up of HTML, but it is a graphic, make sure you're providing an alt tag um, so that people can understand what that content is. Um, don't make your alt, text, alt tags overly complicated um, or try to put entire infographics worth of content. So this is kind of like an art form in, in describing what an image um, may be. You don't wanna um, overburden a screen reader user with trying to understand what is in this, um, what an image, you just wanna describe and get the general understanding of what that image is conveying. Um, and lastly, don't use image graphics for, <clears throat> don't use images for infographics when possible. Uh, use HTML and CSS to code it onto your site 
uh, versus just posting the image. And, and that actually um, is just beneficial for everyone. So, all right, up next, accessibility testing. Um, so we have some tools uh, that, we, that we wanna go over today. But first, like what is what testing actually is, is the ability to understand how these practices we're talking about are applied when compared to various standards. As we discussed earlier, accessibility standards, uh, web content accessibility guidelines, um, and there are manual and automated tests that can be done. And there's also some tools that you might not be aware of and the pr programs and platforms you use every day. Um, so Microsoft in uh, PowerPoint and Microsoft Word actually have native accessibility testing tools built in um, that are located under the accessibility checker. So if, you, if you're not aware of that, you, you are now, definitely go check them out. It'll help improve the experience for um, your content if you are sharing it with people that um, are operating a screen reader or need to navigate with a keyboard. Um, additionally, Adobe Acrobat has a native accessibility checker tool, as Marissa mentioned earlier. Um, it's pretty robust. It can help you, you know, get a, uh, help you make your, your content accessible. So definitely check those out if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, Arc Toolkit, it's an excellent tool for single web page testing. As we mentioned earlier, um, Arc Toolkit is a free professional level accessibility testing tool, and it's a it's a Chrome extension that you or your developer can can turn on um, as you're scanning your website and scanning a single page for um, any accessibility issues related to the WCAG guidelines. Uh, and it's it's great just trying to get a quick synopsis of do I have errors? How many errors do I have on my page? Um, I think you can export the content and share that with the developer. And um, here's a quick quick little view of Arc Toolkit. Uh, so you can identify, again, quickly visible errors, totals, warning signs to look out for. And um, then you can, you can take you know, immediate actions and next steps. Uh, so definitely worth checking that out. Uh, and we'll provide links to that after the, the webinar uh, uh, with, uh, as we send out an email with the recording of the webinar as well. So um, screen reader testing for website accessibility. So one of the things that developers and, and QA testers will do is they'll manually test your site for screen reader accessibility and compatibility for screen readers. Uh, and they can use a screen reader tool like JAWS screen reader or they can use a screen reader testing tool to test the accessibility of your digital content. Um, so the advantages of using a screen reader testing tool is it's usually easier to adopt those tools um, and, and actually get a better sense of like the accessibility of the content. So screen readers have a high learning curve, whereas screen reader testing tools like JAWS Inspect, it's a little more intuitive. Um, anyone can use it. Uh, so you as a, as a marketer, um, or somebody in your apartment, if you want just to get like a better understanding and not necessarily work with your developer on this, you could use JAWS Inspect, um, scan your, your pages for screen reader compatibility and get a report on you know, some errors that you can go make some changes to right away, or you can pass that off to your developer. So there's some flexibility there. Uh, JAWS Inspect transforms JAWS speech output into a text format for easy bug track and remediation. So it's a really cool tool. And we actually have a webinar coming up on February 2nd of JAWS Inspect. So if you're not familiar with that screen reader testing tool, definitely recommend you registering for that event um, or you know, passing it on to your developer to register for that event to learn more about it. All right, ARC monitoring. We talked about this briefly earlier. Um, on screen, there's a screenshot of uh, the ARC monitoring dashboard. Uh, and again, ARC is the Accessibility Resource Center. Uh, it's a platform, accessibility platform that allows you to enter your domain, scan it, and, and track against the WCAG guidelines um, for accessibility er errors, failures on your site. Um, and so on screen, there's a, a WCAG density score. Um, again, that's been tracked against the WCAG standards. And so you, you basically have received, after entering your domain, a, a benchmark of your accessibility of your site. And the, one of the cool things about this is similar to, to Moz or SEMrush is 
you can track your website's accessibility over time. And so as you, you make adjustments um, to, to, the visual, to the violations that are on your site, you can create test uh, initiatives and, and have your developer um, improve the accessibility of your website by making those code implements and changes. And then um, track your, your website history and, and make sure that you're, you're on track with where you wanna be uh, as you set your goals. Uh, and if new, uh, new errors arise, as you release new content, you can let your developer know and, um, and, and, and make sure that you're prioritizing these failures that happen. The other thing is um, developers don't have to go scouring the web for uh, the solution to the violations that you've identified uh, on your website. Uh, ARC provides the solution to the violation so that you can have the answers right away and your team can take action to remediating um, these accessibility issues. So um, lastly, JAWS Connect. So JAWS Connect is a free user feedback tool that was released in December last year. And it's, it's free for users that, are, that have an ARC account and have uh, ARC monitoring enabled. And so screen reader users can provide feedback quickly. And at the point they're encountering a barrier on your website. So kind of going back to um, the examples we had talked about earlier, where someone is trying to go through the user flow and they're trying to submit a form to you uh, to execute on their objective. If they can't fill out that form, that's a barrier. And so JAWS Connect allows these users to provide feedback to your team so you can go and remediate and make those changes immediately and improve that experience for the next person. Um, similarly, if you're, you know, if you have an e-commerce website and people aren't able to check out, uh, again, if they if they hit that barrier, they can provide feedback right away, and your team can can take immediate action on it. So, again, it's a free user feedback tool, as long as you have an ARC account um, and you have monitoring enabled. And we can talk more about that and um, later on. And with that, uh, I think we have some time for some questions. So in case you are not looking at them, um, in the chat, I have put the links to the webinar that Mike mentioned on JAWS Inspect. I have the link to the JAWS Connect um, solution that he talked about, as well as the link to the ARC Toolkit Chrome extension. So does anybody have any questions about the webinar or any of our presentation, any of our tools? Okay, well, <laughs> I don't see any questions. If you have a question or, you know, tomorrow, if it comes to you, then uh, you can email Ida, I-D-A at tpgi.com and she will route any questions about this webinar to me and Mike. So um, thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate your time and we hope that we've been able to provide a, um, some valuable information for you. So have a great day. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.